The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. So um, a number of, I just want the Ustream people particularly to know that a, young, a number of um, Bible school students want to attend Module 1, which is going to be taught by Dennis and Dr. Jen um, in a week, the end of February, but again in the end of March. And um, these students need scholarships to attend. So if you've benefited at all from the books, the DVDs, uh, any of the... Um, teachings here and gone to the modules yourselves, this is an opportunity to donate so that some others could take advantage of what God is doing here. And um, what, the way to do it is to go to forgive123.com and press the donation button of any amount. But actually what you'll be doing is taking what God is doing here and, and in their hearts to the nations. So that is not a small thing. And I, and I want the, especially the Ustream people to know that this is all a part of TEAM, which is the uh, Training Embassy for Advanced Ministry, T-E-A-M. But it also is totally equipping all missionaries, because these are missionary students. And um, just an add-on, there are approximately 50 people in this company of believers that have accomplished, out of devotion and love for our Jesus, very much. So we want you, you streamers, to come on and be a part of that. Thank you. For those of you that didn't read my lips, this is what, <laughs> this is what happens when Jesus washes your sins. He makes them white as snow. Right? Okay. I think we got a small group here. We had two flakes of snow, and that probably scares people. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, not the Austrians or the Germans or the Russians that didn't. They didn't. I'm not afraid of a little couple flakes of snow in Massachusetts and Connecticut and Colorado. And this is, right. Pennsylvania and New York. All right, All right. What, I, what I wanted to do tonight is, uh, how, many, how many saw Sunday's message? Raise your hand. Okay, so the ones that didn't, we're going to have fun with them. All right. We're going to do some question and answer. We'll do some uh, ministry. I want to, I'm going to skip right to uh, the four elements. On Sunday, we talked about the basic topic of authority. Authority spiritual, authority positional. And there's four elements in a hierarchy, if you want to call it that, of authority. And then I want you to tell me why this is true. If there's anybody who believes that it's not true, why are they wrong? <laughs> okay. First of all, we would understand authority, spiritual authority, the first level or the priority is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Can anybody give me scriptures that would validate that he's first? Brianna. That 
that we might know him, that we might progressively become more intimately acquainted with him. That's going toward the nature. That's a good one. Paul. Force of everything, because in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Right. Yeah, that would sum up that would sum up both the scriptures. Basically, the reason that he would be first place in authority is he is the cause, and I use the word source. And in understanding even the word discernment means to distinguish or differentiate. And when you discern in the spirit realm, there's holy, there's God and his holy spirit, there's evil spirit, and then there's human spirits. You want to know, when you discern the nature and the person of God is what you want to learn first. That should be the first authority and the most ruling authority in your life. That Jesus himself, as a person, his divine nature would rule in your heart. Now, nature is actually something that is his essence. His essence, his nature should be first. But it's not this uh, pantheistic view. It's basically a person, the person of the Lord Jesus. It's not God in some uh, undefined way. So if this is the first level of authority, that Jesus Christ would be Lord and that everything that we would teach to balance word and spirit is that Jesus would be Lord in spirit and in truth. And a lot of times you can replace the word truth with reality. In spirit and in reality. So we need both. But why, why would the word be second, Paul? Tell you what, let's just leave Paul with the microphone because I'm going to pick on him a great deal. Paul. Well, again, it's because Jesus is the cause and the word was given by the Holy Spirit. Um, when you speak, talk, when you say word, do you mean the scripture? Scripture. Scripture. Well, um, is the scripture in fact an authority? Hmm? Is the scripture an authority for the believer? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the, um, you can make the scripture say what you want the scripture say. So, I guess just like any other denomination, they see everything what they want to believe within their scripture but if I say well the scripture still hasn't because it says that the scripture still didn't record everything of the Lord so, so the Lord has to be more than the scripture itself because the scripture is just a fraction of who he is although yeah. I guess it's the framework now, yeah, let's stop right there I like that the scripture is a fraction of who he is. What do you mean by a fraction? It means that the whole counsel of God, Jesus said in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So he's expressing himself in, in many different ways. Is that scriptural, even in and of itself, that he expresses himself in many ways? But, but God expressed himself in many ways, but he expressed them in our time through his son, Jesus Christ. So a person trumps the expression. 
the expression, highest form of expression is the expression of Jesus, the Son. He told that to Philip. Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's really a high compliment, isn't it, to Jesus' earth walk? That he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No one's seen the Father. But if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That means his expression as the living word was to express his character and his nature. All right, so you're a believer, and you get saved, and this Jesus, suddenly you know, you know him in your knower, in your spirit. You know him. Then you must proceed to endeavor to know him more completely. And him, Jesus and his word are one. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Therefore, this is going to be the avenue that by the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. Wasn't that why the Holy Spirit was given to us? Is that he would guide us into all truth. So the Holy Spirit, the more you know the person of the Lord Jesus, the more you learn to lean on the spirit of God, he will guide you into all truth. He is the spirit of truth. And when God reveals this, not just to your intellect, you can learn the word of God in your intellect. Unsaved people could study the word. But when the Spirit guides you into the Word, you actually have a supernatural encounter with the author of that Word. And he's revealing a part of himself to you. When you get that kind of a Word, that Word then becomes written on the tablet of your heart. And your value system is not just, I believe the Bible, what it says. Because there's a lot of people say, I know God loves me, but I don't have any experiential knowledge of it. I just read it. So the goal is to draw so intimately close to God that he guides you into the word and then the word is revealed to you to be written on the tablet of the heart or an engrafted word. We use that word, engrafted word. And then you walk in the light that you have. Right? You can't do anything more than that. You can only walk in the light that you have. So that implies then that the third level is your conscience. But your conscience isn't... You can have a peace and your conscience cannot feel guilt because you're walking in the light that you have. But if God then shines with his nature, what's the scripture say? He shines in his face through the face of Jesus Christ, he shines on your heart. If all of a sudden God begins to illuminate or shine the word on your heart, your conscience is going to go, oh, I didn't know that. Now you're in a place of accountability to where your conscience didn't bother you until light shined. And when it shined, your conscience said, ooh, I need to make an adjustment. That's what... And when the Word does that, it's because God is shining the light of the Word on you. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful, meaning it's living. It's a living Word. Quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, divides asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So uh, if God's going to divide flesh from spirit, that living word comes in, it shines on your heart. You were feeling real good until you opened and read something. And the Holy Spirit took that something, shined it on your heart. And, and usually it goes something like this. I was okay. And then I read this and I went, ooh. Right? That's the first feeling. Ooh. And then you go, yield to it. Embrace it. Humble yourself to it. And then you go, ah. Ah. God's not out to destroy you. He's out to separate flesh from spirit so that he puts you back together again and you're operating under his anointing. It says all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. And that's verse 13 after verse 12 just said the word of God is quick and living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. So when you read that scripture, you're thinking of this, right? The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I'm thinking when I'm reading that, my mind is going word, 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 word. The scripture, the scripture, the scripture. But then verse 13 takes a turn. 
All things are naked and open to the eyes of him. It doesn't say the word. It's not treated like an it. It's treated as a living word or a reality word or the truth that's alive and powerful. So an unsaved person could read the word and think of it what they want to think of it. But the goal is to get the Spirit of God and meet the living word and be transformed, like it says in uh, Corinthians, transformed into his image from glory to glory. To be transformed into his image means something of his nature. Isn't Jesus often referred to as the light? Okay, I am the light of the world. That light, by the power of the Holy Spirit, shines on the word shines in our heart, and then we're being what we would call dealt with. I'm being dealt with. Like, ooh, ah. Uh, all right? <laughs> it has a good feeling and a bad feeling at first, right? Because it's, it's the application of the cross. So here's what it's doing. It's like a sword dividing asunder. Uh, in the Greek word, that's uh, merismos. Uh, to merismos means to divide asunder. Well, this is bad, that's where the word went. This is good, then you yield the will and choose this, that is good. What happens then is God, you basically agreed with God and he puts that mind, will, and emotions back under the authority of the, of the word of God. And you start thinking, feeling, and acting in accordance to the word of God. That's internal transformation. So this conscience is a, is, in, is a product of your spirit. Your conscience is down here. How many know that if some, you did something wrong, that it, you kind of feel it in the gut? Like, mm, I shouldn't have done, I shouldn't have shut up. Or I should have said something. Or mm, the bzz, there's a buzzer in there, that conscience. And God puts that in your spirit to... And everybody's got one, all right? And the conscience is not here. The conscience is here. And it's basically, there's a difference between consciousness, which pertains to the mind, and conscience. Conscience is the gut. Not, they're not synonymous. Conscious, when you're conscious, it means you're awake, you're not sleeping. All right? Um, this conscience rules your will or your choices. So when you say someone is walking in the light, their conscience isn't convicting them that they're okay. We used an example Sunday where a friend of mine talked about a new convert, and this guy was so on fire for God. He'd come out of the drug culture, and he was just, oh, they were making him a deacon because this man just burned for Jesus. He was just on fire. And then they're having, starting a building program. He donated $10,000 to the building program. And they went, wait a minute. Where did you get $10,000 to donate to the building program? He said, I sold, all my, I sold all the dope that was in my barn. And the pastor had to take him on the side and say, no, no, we're, we don't want that money for the building fund. I'll tell you what we got to do. And actually, it made the front news. Uh, I think this is somewhere in Texas, but it made the front newspaper that pastor brings in former who, because of his conversion to Jesus, has turned all of his drugs over to the sheriff. But after what he was doing, he was doing what the clear conscience, right? And actually his motive was pure. He was walking in the light that he has. But just because you're walking in the light that you have doesn't mean you don't need more light. <laughs> so none of us have arrived yet. And it was amazing that they turned that around <laughs> to a really good thing. But your conscience is built in such a way by God that you are to discern right from wrong, but you should have, if you're really hungering after God, that conscious, you should have an inbuilt desire to be morally better. 
say, but God, I know I'm doing all right, but there's got to be more. And then when there's more, and if you're really hungry for more, he's going to put his finger on some things that you might need to change or deal with in your life. In other words, any darkness, it, there's probably dark areas. There's unevangelized areas in the heart of a, of a Christian. There's things that have not yet heard the gospel, even though you think you've heard the gospel. There's parts of you that has not yet really heard, heard it. Uh, so this inbuilt desire is that I'm going to become better morally in my belief system because my conscience, this level of authority, does not justify all my behavior. It simply says I'm doing the best I can and I'm walking in the light that I have. But I have a desire to walk in greater light and greater intimacy with God. Therefore, I am allowing God to shine his light upon my heart. And he shines it through the face of Jesus Christ, and he will take specific scriptures so that it's like a, a lawyer out of, taking out of a law book. He'll take that appropriate statute pattern or principle to say, here, you need to deal with this. And then the word will go, mm, this is wrong. Well, I didn't know it was wrong before. Well, you do now. I just shine my light on it. So it goes, now you choose. You choose God's way, then he puts it back together and anoints it, and it's a sanctified area in your life, and it's an area of anointing now. What was dead or dull <laughs> now has an anointing. So the good news is, even if your life was so screwed up that you feel like my whole life was like a pin cushion. I've been stuck and full of holes my whole life. Well, the good news is, as you allow God to search your heart, those are the very areas that can, an anointing can flow out of that. He wants light. Wherever you turn it over to God, any darkness in you that his light shines on now becomes something that can be expressed outwardly. So uh, your life might be like Swiss cheese, all full of holes, but if God shines his light through it, if you deal with it, those are areas of anointing. So your weakest areas could be some of your strongest anointings. Write down your weakest areas sometime. That could be your strongest anointing if you let God be God and be Lord in that area. All right. So uh, <clears throat> the second element of that obedience to the conscience uh, is understanding that what God wants to write has to be in both places. It has to be in the mind and the heart. So that's going to put you to where you're going to have to study this, this word inside out and backwards because God wants it written in the mind, but more importantly, he wants it written on the heart. That's where he deals with you. Most people have more Bible in their mind than they have written on their heart. But you still have to have a, a source for your value system, otherwise your conscience will... You, you see this in the world right now. Many Christians, are, they're, they're basically, their value system is not based on the Word of God. They're letting the world shape their value system, and they're compromising the Word of God. And they'll tell you, I've got a piece about it. I'm, my conscience doesn't bother me. Because their value system is gradually leaning to something that's no longer scriptural. These levels of authority, remember... This trumps this. This trumps this. This is the structure of true authority. And by the way, look at this. Fivefold ministers, we're the fourth level. So don't get too puffed up or think you're some kind of dictator or some kind of a pope, bishop, cardinal. And I'm not speaking about Catholics. I'm speaking about an attitude. Apostle prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, you get so puffed up on that, but when you realize it, you're a fourth level of authority. Is that true? Are there times when your conscience, based on your value system, may cause you to question authority? Oh, you like that part. Some of you like that part too much. <laughs> you're not supposed to like that part, but it's, it's part of the value system. Um, if you like it, then you're probably guilty of something else. You know what the most missing ingredient in the church is? Honor. Honor your mother and father for family. Honor those in authority and government. Honor those right in the church. They deserve double honor. And honor those in business. 
That means that boss you don't like, he's still your boss. And, and the Bible is very clear on how to deal with the church, government, business, and family. Is there not? It's, it's there. It's just a question of to the degree you will honor it. <clears throat> and we're not talking about honoring bad behavior. We're talking about praying for them and releasing yourself from the judgment that causes you problem. <clears throat> so, uh, conscience then has to be written in the mind and the heart. And every time, let's get in here. Again, I want our people to be experts on understanding the mind, the will, and the emotions. If there is uh, a stronghold, um, very often in the mind there is a lie, mental stronghold, there is something that's contrary to the Word of God. The emotion for a stronghold is always coming from the wrong kingdom. And so if it's the wrong kingdom in general, it'll be fear. Because God didn't give you a spirit of fear. Fear is the enemy's territory, and all the kingdom of evil is fear-based. So if there's a mental stronghold that needs to come down, there's usually a lie behind it in the mind, fear in the emotion, <clears throat> And in the will, if there's a stronghold, there's an idol that doesn't want to come down. You can make an idol out of anything, too. And it can interfere with God speaking to you because it's, it's become a stronghold. So, <clears throat> to get a stronghold to come down, you first have to deal with the power source not the lie. I've watched people try to renounce the lie while they're still in fear. It doesn't work. There's no anointing on fear. Instead, deal with the fear until you get the peace of God. And what does scripture say when you get the peace of God? He's ruling. He's Lord. At that moment, he's Lord in your life. You're in a place of authority. Jesus is Lord. We're going up here. Let the peace of God rule. And <clears throat> did you notice that when we talk about the kingdom of God or the rule of, and you can't have a kingdom without a king. So when we talk about the kingdom of God or seek first the kingdom of God, we're still seek first the king. All right. Seek first the kingdom of God. You could actually say, seek first the shalom of God or the peace of God. And it would still be accurate. You could also say that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Do you realize all three of those have to do with his nature? No matter what, because people can build a case for anything with this, right? With the intellect, you can build a, even an ungodly case. I mean, when, when I first got saved, I had drug buddies that were trying to, that were just coming into Christianity, and then innocently enough, some of them would say, well, the, God made the herbs of the field and he said everything was good. <laughs> They're justifying their pot. You know, I mean, you can, right? <laughs> you can play with this, but you can't play with this. Because God is the spirit of truth. He will never put peace on a lie. He would be, the spirit of truth would have to go against his own nature. So the peace of God, and I'm talking about peace, I'm not talking about absence of conflict, I'm talking about that supernatural peace that surpasses your understanding, the peace that Jesus gave that the world can't even give it. So the kingdom of God is more defined by the nature of the king, by the essence of the king. Actually, righteousness is a feeling to me. Because under the new covenant, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness is love and action. If love and action, peace, and joy is the kingdom, the ultimate authority of Jesus himself is God doesn't have some love. What have, what have you who always heard this? God is love. That is the very essence. So you must, nature must trump the word, must trump 
conscience. So just because you feel okay here, right now there's a, there's a lot of loosey-loosey uh, teachings going on and people are trying to justify it and they're trying to even justify it here when the word clearly says otherwise. But it's like, if you don't deal with guilt properly, you will find a pseudo philosophy or something to cover up the guilt until you basically uh, get past feeling. Isn't that what the scripture calls it? Who having been past feeling, you basically numb. You put enough pillows on your conscience, eventually you won't hear it ring. <laughs> right? But what this does is, God, I want to know you intimately. I want that word to shine on my heart, and I want my conscience to shout. You should pray that way. Pray that your conscience is so sensitive that it shouts. This is right. This is wrong. This is clean. This is unclean. And act promptly accordingly. Now, this last area is delegated authority. This is the fact that whether you like it or not, God will never do away with it because that's part of his structure. And you may not like the government, you may not like the church leaders, you might not like the family, uh, but there's, there's wisdom in honoring those leaders. And there's ways to honor them without agreeing with everything they say. Now we have a question from Paul. This delegated authority pushed a button in Paul. So Paul? What, what is higher? A physical, like a biological father or a church authority? It's actually, it's both. But it does bring into question this. It says, honor your mother and father that things may go well with you. That doesn't mean honor their bad behavior. You could have had abusive mother and father. But there is a spiritual principle that elevates it when it says, if you would honor them, in other words, you forgive them for their bad behavior in the kingdom that sets you free to learn a principle. But here's another thought to answer your question. Uh, when Jesus said, your mother and your... Uh, brothers, sisters, are, want to talk to you. He said, these are my mother, my brother, my sisters, they who do the will of God from the heart. There's a time to prioritize over family. But what is higher ranked? If you, if you have, a, like for example, your dad is a pastor, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, no, 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 you yourself, you're a pastor. Right. We're going to let Jason answer and that because yours, he's got that situation. Yeah, he's like, got his earthly father here. and no, he's Well, it is, but, but not really. Let's assume you would not be a pastor. You would be just his dad. Okay. Right? But he's a pastor. So would, he, would you submit to him because he's your pastor? Or would he submit to you because you're his dad? When, Jason, it, when it's well, about when it's about well, Jason when it's that a, one. when it's about spiritual ranking. Pass the. Don't walk in front of the camera, Paul. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we do have you on a couple of videos. I think I think it depends on uh, the, the the place of where that that person is. Like, um, if I'm recognizing him as my father and I'm, I'm, I would go to him for something for fatherly advice. I'm, I'm honoring his position as a father but I could, be, I could be his pastor and so if he comes to me with spiritual questions or whatever then I'm acting as the authority in that, in that room. So it, it depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. um, it's not I'm, I'm holier than thou you must bow to me type of thing. It's, it depends on the situation. And there's honor got to flow both ways. So. Right. God wants you to honor both, but there is a distinction. I, get, uh, I would say positional authority and spiritual authority. I would rather have, I would rather have prayers from a little intercessor who loved God and had great spiritual influence with God, 
compared to a pastor who is a pastor in position. I'd rather have that little intercessor pray for me based on spiritual influence would trump positional influence in that case. But God wants you to honor both. So even the question of which is more is, is difficult because it has to be, it'd be the same that you put Jesus. I can't picture Jesus uh, dissing or disrespecting his earthly family during his earth walk. It wouldn't happen. But there were times for the advancement of the kingdom, and this is where people need to learn. I've seen people that got saved and their whole life was built around their family and never got beyond their family and thought that was a virtue. But there's, there's a whole world out there that God wants you to impact. And if you just wait for your family to come around and that's your, quote, your ministry, your family, the secular people do that. Unsaved people that are going to go to hell do that. Make their family number one. So I think Jesus showed how to honor mother and father growing up in submission to them. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered, but he also gave a very powerful example that when it came to kingdom, kingdom principles, or like, remember when he went to the temple? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? But he was not being disrespectful because he was simply clarifying that I have purpose in this life and I must be about that purpose. That purpose always exceeds the positional authority in our life. Are you going to still serve God even if uh, we have a president of the United States that's unsaved? Are you still commanded to pray for them? You know, so it's, it's not, to me, it's not an either or, but uh, I would always prefer spiritual influence over positional influence. I think there's some godly people that can draw so close to God that they have great influence with God because of intimacy. Someone else could have a title or a position and not really operate in it very well in any realm. That's why I believe, you know, how many of you, you've heard of the seven, the seven pillars of society or the seven mountains, right? Uh, those, those seven pillars of society, those seven mountains, say, say all of this authority comes under church, home, business, and uh, family. Let's say, what did I say, church, home? No, church, government, business, and family. Let's say, um, well, well, let's just say that it was Paul. Paul was called to the business realm. This could be prophetic. And he was called, that is a sphere for him. In that realm of authority, you would have to say he could be called to that, but I would want to know what is the weakness of that mountain and make sure that God dealt with me on the inside before I became, all right, what would you say the weakness is in business in general? Perhaps greed, the love of money. What would be the downside? You can't think of a downside. No, there's just like, we, we might need an appointment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say the root of all evil is money. So I guess so the be, biggest thing about it is... I mean, what do you do business for? You do business to bear mm -hmm. fruits. What okay. Your fruit? your fruit so then, if someone was called to that realm, just being called to that realm isn't sufficient. There has to be an internal work. If you were called to government, if most people mess up in government, and there's godly people that have gone into government, and if they mess up, how do they usually mess up? Corrupt? Bribes? That would be the kind of thing that I would want God to, God's nature to work on me so that that was not my weakness, even if I was called to that realm of authority. Now, what I'm, what I'm showing you here was when I wanted to go to school and God wouldn't let me, he said, I'm going to take you to the school of the Spirit. This is what to me is so unique. He took me through these four levels in my training without me knowing it. 
First of all, he said, Dennis, when you close your eyes, you drop down into your spirit, you touch my nature. And prayer for you is not talking, although it includes talking. It includes dialogue. But he says, when you drop down into spirit and you touch me spirit to spirit, you're in prayer because prayer is being with someone. It's not an it. It's not knowledge of the word. It's him. It's the living word. Then when he would take me to a scripture, I did what I think a lot of people did. In my flesh, he would say, Dennis, out of your belly. And then I'd finish his sentence because I'd feel life on it. You know, if God speaks to you, a scripture, and it's got life on it, I don't know about you, but I'm a talker. So when I felt like if he said, out of your belly, I would go, out of your belly flows rivers of living water. And then uh, there's a river that makes glad the city of God. And then I felt like the anointing kind of, and I'm going, what's wrong? I was excited. What's wrong? God gave me a, what he wanted me to do was to be a partaker of the divine nature in that word. And I blew it off with all that I knew about that word. You see a difference there? That would be an easy mistake. What he taught me was that when he quickened the word to me was to be still and to let it become an engrafted word. What, what, what would engrafted mean? Take hold, take root, and let it grow. Actually, an engrafted word is the same thing that happens when a woman gets pregnant. The seed, the fertilized seed attaches to the womb. It gets engrafted and therein grows. That's what God wanted. When he gives you a scripture, he wants it to be real. He wants it to be part of himself. He wants to reveal his divine nature. He wants to shine it in your heart to such a degree that you own it. Most people don't want to stop there. But then that word becomes substance. It becomes your value system now is not... You could be a cult and have a value system. You could be a foreign religion and have a value system. But when this nature speaks a word to you and that word becomes your value system, your value system is Jesus then. That's the safest value system. Then if your conscience is clear, you say, I know and my conscience bears with my conscience, my, you know, uh, it's, it's the love of God. I can tell that's his nature because I spend time in his presence and spending time in his presence, I know his nature and that's him not a word. Then, basically, your value system then becomes your behavior. It becomes your motive. But look at the motive, the character. Your actions should flow out of character change, motivation, and attitude. If this is the source, then your attitude, your motive, it's going to be the love of God. And it's going to be behavior prompted by the love of God. It's going to be motivated by him, not by you or dead works. If you're called to delegated authority, what is the purpose of delegated authority? And why is this number four out of all of this? It says, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers were given for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. Hmm. Now, wait a minute. So then this kind of minimizes you being a big shot again. You should be coaching the saints to do the work of the ministry. So rather than being this expert that does it to them, you're supposed to be teaching them to do the work of the ministry. And here's what the Lord showed me. It says, it is no different for Dennis as a pastor. I should be teaching the same way he taught me. I should be teaching you to know him, to become intimately acquainted with him by his nature. Otherwise, if you go here right away without knowing him, people are going to prophesy stuff to you and you're not going to know if it's God or not. You might know this word real good and you say, it's scriptural, but the devil can quote scripture. I'm not taking in something that doesn't have the nature of my God on it. 
And people are not testing it by the nature or the spirit. They're testing it by the word. So you don't ever want to get here faster than this. And most of us know more word than we know this. So if you're going to train up or teach a people, you want them to have their own relationship with Jesus to encourage them. And all the epistles do this already. If we were to follow the emphasis in the epistles, it's that you would grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The growth is not grow in knowledge, grow in grace. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you to be and to do. So it goes right back to the source then. Go back to the power source, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lordship of Jesus. So there's two things down here for delegated authority. And I think the church, you're going to see this. If not in my lifetime, you're going to see it. Eventually it has to change to the priesthood of the believer. It's got to change to where fivefold ministers equip the saints to do the work of the ministry and bring them into the unity of the faith. We have a responsibility to bring unity and immaturity never unifies. Immaturity has a difficult time unifying. Immaturity in the church thinks they've arrived when they can become independent and I need no one. That's kind of like a teenager's attitude. At, at some point in their life, they're no longer sickly dependent on mom and dad. They're now they're independent, but they think they've arrived. No, you've arrived when you can be so secure in your significance as an individual that you can in, be interdependent with others without being intimidated or feeling like you're losing your identity. In other words, if, you're, if we got a room full of potatoes, uh, we're all going to get mashed potatoes, you know, <sighs> you know, then I will lose who I am and somehow, you know. No, what you'll do is you, you'll create a tapestry of expression that the purpose for the church in Ephesians 3.10 says that the multifaceted, manifold wisdom of God would be made known to the world, the flesh and the devil, I mean the, the world, principalities and powers, through the multiple expression of a church. But the church would be a church that's coming together in the unity of the faith unto the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man. A mature man. And that's basically when we name the ministry full stature, that is to be the prime directive, is to get people to grow up unto full stature. So, if God taught me in this order, and I believe this is a proper order, don't you? Then your leaders should be doing the same thing. And oftentimes we put great emphasis on this and that's important because what did God say? It needs to be written on the mind and the heart but we can't skip having it written on the heart just because we've got it in the mind. That's the downside. You've got to have this because otherwise your conscience will be clear with a faulty value system. That's why it's third. Remember, there's things that don't bother your conscience because you don't know this well enough. But you don't know this well enough by just reading it. You know this well enough by knowing the author. So there has to be a transition to where we're going to go a little bit more to where when we read the word, we're not reading just for content. There's a place for that. But you should be reading the word with the intent that I want to meet the author. And Jesus himself said, that this is the reason that I was born, that I might testify to the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Testify to the truth means I will to testify to the reality, not just truths. I am the truth. I am the reality. All this truth is an expression of the reality of the person. This is eternal life, that they might know me, John 17, 3. That actually explains that. That's a good one for this one. Anyway, the nature this is eternal life, that they would know me. This is, eternal life is not just living forever. The eternal life is knowing God. Okay? Now, within positional authority and spiritual authority, 
we should endeavor to get spiritual authority even if we were called to positional authority in any of these realms. And what does the Bible warn against novices? What's the danger of a novice? An immature. A novice is a, a beginner. If you have a beginner who's six months old in the Lord and they're going to pastor, that'd be a little scary. Right? In business, a father turns the business over to the son. The son has no experience whatsoever. Takes the business down with them. Is that common? Does that happen? Family. The father, a bad father, will basically give a false view so that when God, and we ran into this when we traveled to churches, that when people talk about God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's people that cringe when you say God the Father. And they're believers. Their experience is so bad with the Father image that they don't even like to hear that. That's sad. That's because this, in their experience, it gave such an improper view. But you know what? There's great men of God throughout history that were raised as orphans. Look at Moses. Talk about rejection issues. Put in a basket. <laughs> Sent down the creek. All right? These people grew up in a relationship with God to where God says, I'm going to show you what, I'm going to teach you what a father's to be like. And even that example we're using before about uh, natural father versus spiritual. There was a day when my father came forward to the altar to get a father's blessing. What if I just said, no, I'm going to wait for my dad to get saved? I'd have probably never done anything because he got saved after, way after I did. But he knew that he was raised without ever hearing an affirming word through a male voice. My grandfather never spoke anything kind to him. So here it is, I'm pastoring, and my own father comes up for prayer to, to get a blessing that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He rather have, he's the father in the natural, positionally, but he'd rather have had my spiritual blessing from God the Father. It's an interesting, it's interesting father-son, because... You have to be a son unto the Father. God the, you have to be a son unto God the Father before you can be a father unto sons. Right? You can't really be a father unto sons till you've truly been a son unto the Father. Look at Jesus. He was 33, and he wasn't too old to call his father Abba, Daddy. <laughs> he didn't outgrow that. He said, I go to my Abba and your Abba. So, do you think if we trained a generation in that order, they would be healthier? Stina, what do you think? Guy, any comments on any of this? Give Stina the microphone. I think the most exciting thing about this is that as we experience his nature, that his word actually becomes engrafted and then we're a reflection and we can be, each person can be a reflection to honor the Father. That really excites me. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that, the, that there's no end to the amount that we can have the Lord engrafted into us. There's always more, and that to me makes life worth living. Mm -hmm. There's more to experience in Him, and I think that's the, the, that brings security. Mm -hmm. Each each piece we absorb gives us security in our identity in Him. People struggle with that word identity, when in reality. 
instead of trying to figure out who you are, the closer we draw to who he is, the more we understand who we are. I think you can get so hung up on who you are in Christ that the issue becomes you. Who am I in Christ? Like Christ is the side issue. Who am I? When in reality is that if you would lose your life, you would find it. If you would abandon yourself, he wants to live his life through you. That's when you're secure. You're secure is when you're saying, you live your life through me. And it's not about who am I in Christ, but it's, it's, it's like Paul said, Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And this life that I do live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's no longer I that live. We're still too focused on I. To really find life, you'd have to lose it. You have to, you have to lose the lower life to gain the higher life. But, but the point is, is that we can obsess over our identity. And I've seen people confused by it more than helped by it. Why don't we just pursue that we might know him? If you pursue that you would know him, you know, like just say, forget about yourself momentarily, that your motivation is that I might know him. And then he shines his light through the face of Jesus Christ on us. And then we are changed from glory to glory, or we are changed more into his image. Whose image? His image. It isn't about us. It's about being changed into his image. It should be a big Christ, a little I, not a big who am I in Christ. That transition could radically change an individual. They're so afraid of being a zero. <laughs> when in reality, you, have, you lose, the, you, you, you get rid of that fear of being a nothing. And he becomes your all. There's a good one for revelation. Uh, walk in the various revelations or attributes of Jesus. Walk in the revelation that he's your all in all. Say, God, shine that on my heart. Teach me what does that mean to be my all in all. You would have to get self out of the way for him to be your all in all. To move in a revelation of Jesus is my all in all. He's my exceedingly great reward. I don't need this or that to confirm it. Okay. I just think that this would be healthy for some people to write this in their Bible in case you get a little off track or you get a little frazzled. Go back to this and see where... What part is a little out of order? Because if, if you're getting hung up that nobody's listening to you, you know, a common, a common expression that we need to get rid of is, I'm not getting any respect. Anybody ever use that? All of you have used that before, one time or another. I'm not getting any respect. I'm being disrespected. There may be a little too much emphasis on your position rather than the character and the nature of God. If you're not exhibiting Jennifer, uh, when her late husband was unsaved and Jennifer was saved, she would tell God, she'd tell God on him all the time. God, look at what he's doing now, right, Jennifer? And what did the Lord tell Jennifer? He says, when, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace. Oh, in Proverbs, I guess you want me to change my attitude. <laughs> Is that possible? That you need an attitude? You're the believer and they're the unbeliever. And God says, I want you to change your attitude toward them. Hmm? We judge others by their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions. It's easy to do that. So if you feel disrespected in your authority realm, perhaps, perhaps there's a needed adjustment in there to where you need to go back and investigate and let the Lord speak to you. And then you go back to his nature 
and open your heart to him and he'll give you a word. And then it'll hit this and it'll go and you go, oh, oh, I don't know that I really wanted to hear that. But then you submit to it and you'll be the better for it. Does the scripture tell you to, to have a proper attitude toward your boss at work, even if he's evil? It does tell you to watch your attitude, doesn't it? The scriptures and the epistles are very clear on these four realms of authority on how to behave. Just think if we actually did that. And I say the way to do that is ultimately God's going to get you back there. I worked in an office once where the guy, my superior, hated Christians. And I would work through my lunch feeling that it would be a good Christian witness. That if I worked through lunch, that that would be somehow, I was going to give it 100%. I knew I was called a full-time ministry, but while I was in that office, I was going to give it 110%. But he hated Christians. He'd go tell the big boss who couldn't see me, he's He's got, he's praying, he's not doing his work. He's praying, he's one of those people, you know, one of those Christians, he's praying. And internally, there was that battle about, why that little brat, you know? <laughs> this is like, he's my boss and he's lying and telling the big boss that I'm busy praying instead of doing my job. But you know what? God always got me to go back there and change my heart attitude. It's like, I'm in charge of your reputation, not, not him. You're giving him too much power. And you give power to what you give attention to, and I was giving too much attention to it. And the funny thing is, is then I, was, I would think, but what, but what my record, it, it'll be on my record that I would, that, what a bad witness that is, that's gonna be on my record. That was a bad witness, that's gonna be on my record. The company folded up. I went into full-time ministry and I was the only one that had a job <laughs> out of that whole corporation. So it was like, they were all looking for work and for me, that was a launching pad into full-time ministry. So for me, I didn't, uh, worrying about what was on that record by somebody lying. Do you think you'll ever be persecuted or falsely accused as a believer? Do you think God will deal with you that you need to adjust accordingly. Your attitude, regardless of their lies or accusations, that's why this trumps everything. His peace needs to rule in your heart. Okay? Amen. Now, the better version of that was Sunday, for those of you that didn't see it, but it's on Ustream. It's called authority. Oh, I forgot to do this on you, stream. This is the best of the best. We just finished this. Intimate prayer. After I was saved about 14 years, God took me into a six-month season of prayer, and he gave seven life-changing encounters. And we, find, we used to have it on cassette but now we finally got it on DVD and CD with the outline in the booklet. If a pr simple prayer is simple, this is intimate prayer, and this took time, weeks at a time on one subject. And You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.